At least 55 people have died in wildfires on two Hawaiian islands. Many more are still missing. The governor says the blazes are the worst natural disaster ever to hit that U.S. state. The coastal town of Lahaina on the island of Maui has been razed to the ground. Many residents had harrowing escapes, and some are questioning whether the authorities did enough to warn people of the danger. The historic Hawaiian town of Lahaina, reduced to smoldering rubble almost overnight. As firefighters work to extinguish the last of the flames, authorities have begun assessing the scale of the damage. We probably have well over a thousand buildings that have been destroyed. Many, many hundreds of families have been displaced. We'll rebuild. The president has already, just in six hours, authorized and approved our request for emergency support. But it's going to be a long haul. Seen from the air, the once vibrant town appears little more than a wasteland of ash and ruins. Rescue teams have been deployed from the US mainland. But with hundreds of people still missing, there are fears that many never made it out alive. Some of those who did are returning home, only to find they've lost everything. Um, this is our first time coming back and like actually knowing that our house burned down. We haven't really known anything for the last couple of days because there's no information coming through. Tens of thousands of tourists have been evacuated from the island of Maui. But for the majority of Lahaina's residents, there is no home to flee to. Many will now move to emergency shelters across the island as the government works to open hotels and holiday houses for those now left homeless. Oh, this is going to take years, years to recover. And it, it just breaks my heart that all the history from back in the whaling days of the 1800s, dust, ash and dust. But despite the challenge and the cost, Hawaii's authorities and its people have vowed to rebuild, however long it takes. Meteorologist Matthew Capucci has been following the developments in Hawaii. I asked him earlier if these wildfires are different from those that Hawaii is used to seeing. Well, traditionally, Hawaii would periodically see very small fires that would break out in kind of a field or something like that. In this case, this was a big residential fire that really engulfed the entire town. It reflects two different things. One, very bad and unfortunately series of weathers, uh, weather conditions sort of overlapping. But number two, changes in land use. For starters, we had a tropical cyclone, a big hurricane passing about 800, 900 kilometers to the south of Hawaii, Hurricane Dora. Wasn't a big deal for the island, but it began pulling winds out of the north. That slight northerly flow eventually went down the mountains, doing something called downsloping. So pockets of air would heat up and dry out as they went down the mountains, accelerating downwards and causing faster winds in the lowlands. That helped to fan the flames. In other words, knocked over a power line or something like that, sparked a fire. That fire was able to very quickly grow and take advantage of antecedent dry conditions thanks to an ongoing drought there. So again, that just caused the fire to grow very quickly. However, 50, 60, 70 years ago, a fire like this likely wouldn't have spread as quickly. But nowadays, because of land use, because we're sort of paving over fields, putting more neighborhoods and structures in, the fire can hop from one structure to the next and get out of control very quickly. So natural factors combined with human decisions or policymaking, would you call this then a freak event or is it something that officials there could have foreseen and tried to prevent? I think the overlapping series of different factors at play likely did make this a freak event. However, I do think we need to be better with our urban planning. In other words, if we have to have an evacuation, be it for a fire, a tropical cyclone, anything, can we get everybody from one point to another quickly enough? If there's a fire and somebody's trapped at the beach, do we have the logistics to get them out of there quickly? Are there sideways evacuation routes or is there only one road in and out of town? I don't know necessarily the circumstances that were at play, and I don't think any of us do with this particular incident, but these are the questions that should be in the back of our minds, especially as we recover, as we rebuild communities. Are we building things that are more vulnerable? Or are we building communities that have a better recourse in the future if an event like this begins to unfold again? And this is just one fire in yet another summer of what seems to be catastrophic wildfires all around the world. Can we draw any, any broad links uh, between these various, you know, seemingly natural disasters? 
That's a really good question. I'm glad you asked. You know, Hawaii is kind of unusual in that because it's a tropical island, it's such sort of a small ecosystem with changes so quickly over very short distances that it's tough to try to tie this to human-induced climate change. That said, over much of North America, Europe, Asia, we can make a very strong link between increasing area burn, bigger fires, bigger wildfire seasons, wider windows for fires, and more extreme fire behavior, and the effects of human influence. Consider the western parts of North America, for example. It's hotter, it's drier there, thanks to stagnant high pressure, largely catalyzed by human-induced climate change, these big heat domes, that desiccates, dries out the landscape, which in turn causes the temperature to warm even more. You get this self-reinforcing cycle that makes the ground just ripe to burn. At the same time, because the heat dome is here, because we have heat domes that are getting stronger, the atmosphere, the lower levels, expand a little bit thanks to the heat, which means the ceiling, the triple pause of the lower atmosphere is a little taller, which means smoke plumes can grow taller, almost like thunderclouds, begin to feel the changing winds with height in the atmosphere, sometimes rotate, sometimes just billow even more, and you get more extreme fire behavior. So there are a lot of factors at play. I don't think with Hawaii, it's easy to tie to climate change. It's more land use, but holistically across much of the world, we are seeing a very strong link between fires and human influence in the atmosphere. A fascinating, if not scary, list of factors there that Matthew Capucci has broken down for us. Thanks so much. Well, I'm joined tonight by journalist Naka Nathaniel. Naka is a native Hawaiian who spent years covering major stories around the world. He is now a columnist with the Honolulu Civil Beat. Naka, it's good to see you. I'm glad to know that you and your family are safe. You live on the Big Island, not on Maui, but you wrote in a piece for the LA Times and for the New York Times that you could see smoke on Thursday. I mean, give us an idea of how far away you are, particularly from Lahaina, and um, what did you think when, when you saw that smoke? Did you think a major disaster was underway? No, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, we get winds here all the time. In fact, we end up with the same winds that uh, that did hit Maui. And in the past, you know, it's caused, you know, wildfires, but, you know, nothing of this scope and scale. This is one of those, you know, we're looking around right now trying to figure out what exactly happened. And this is news is starting to come out. We're realizing that, you know, these things that we never imagined, you know, are happening and this is one of the things that we need to do we need to have better imaginations to prepare for these kinds of disasters well you know residents um, on maui say that they were not warned that no sirens sounded i mean how do you think that is possible on an island that regularly drills for tsunamis so tsunamis so this is the story with hawaii hawaii has always been affected by you know one by nature you know whether it's been tsunamis you know earthquakes you know, volcanoes or hurricanes, but we've always figured out how to deal with that. In this case, we're dealing with the consequences of centuries of land mismanagement here in Hawaii. Hawaii is supposed to be the lush tropical paradise that everybody thinks it is, but so much of the island has been given over to, you know, really devastating forms of agriculture, a lot of pineapple plantations, sugar plantations, and ranching. And these are all activities that do not belong on this island. And when those companies, because the economies fell apart in the late uh, 20th century, we've been left with lands that are boxes. And when we end up with substantial winds that come through, it causes these wildfires. And we just don't have the natural protections that we should if Hawaii had been allowed you know, to continue on developing the way it should have. You, you write that this fire is a, is a tipping point. And, and you wrote, I saw just a couple of weeks ago, um, you were asking, would Hawaii be prepared if global warming gets worse? What do you say to that now that this week has happened? This week has happened. I mean, I feel really bad, you know, that, you know, that those words were written too late. You know, I wish that these words had been written, you know, years ago and that, you know, the teams that were put in place to deal with these sorts of disasters to prepare people had been, you know, we're discovering now that many of these, you know, the governor was off island, you know, both the police, uh, both the fire department chief and the head of emergency services in Maui weren't on islands. And, you know, if you don't have good, deep teams to deal with these sorts of situations, if you have single points of failure like it looks like we've had, this is why, you know, we're just in shock right now with the, you know, with what's happened. Yeah, the rest of the world, you know, considers Hawaii as America's piece of paradise. I mean, the place that you go to to escape the realities 
you know, that we all have. I mean, what do you say to the rest of the world tonight about that? I mean, we've, uh, yeah, we've always had the same problems that everybody else has had, and it's been a marvelous marketing machine that has turned Hawaii, you know, into this uh, tourist paradise that people keep coming and, you know, wanting to visit. And it's wonderful. We love visitors. We love interacting and having people come and visit. We just had visitors this past week, and it was marvelous getting them, getting a chance to share, you know, this island with them. But unfortunately, we've had too many. And this is the same story that we've seen, you know, this summer in Europe, too, where Venice has been overwhelmed, where so many tourist sites, you know, you just can't move around. And this is the problem that Hawaii, you know, during COVID, everybody disappeared. And so we got to discover, you know, how special and how quiet and how beautiful Hawaii can be. But Hawaii gets is going to get close to 10 million visitors this year. And we just cannot sustain that. It's just something that's had too great an impact, you know, on our tiny little islands. Yeah, you know, talking about visitors, I remember visiting you and your wife, Meredith, in New York City right after the 9-11 attacks. And I remember, you know, how the shock in the city then was was palpable. Um, I, don't, I don't want to compare that to what has happened here on Maui, but uh, this shock, I mean, what is the shock like there where you are? Is it a, a, a feeling that something has happened and things will never be the same again? It's, you know, it is one of those things that, you know, just like you, I did think it, but I just, you know, I just don't feel comfortable saying that, obviously, you know, just to compare the scale. But when you consider, you know, how large New York City is, how large, you know, and how small, you know, our island is, you know, that this is one of those things that, you know, is just, it's hard to figure out, you know, this is, Maui has always avoided, you know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the bigger disasters that have happened here in, on the big island. And it's just something that, you know, if this place where it can happen, that was the same thing that happened with New York is that, oh, it can happen here. And this is the part that, you know, Hawaii is dealing with right now is it happened here. And that's just the shock, you know, that we're trying to figure out. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I know everyone's still in shock. Maybe we can find some, you know, silver lining in all of this. What would a possible happy ending, in your opinion, what would it look like coming from this tragedy? It's that's and that's I'm in the same, you know, the same boat as you are, Brent. You know, we're looking you know, at this point is that, you know, we know that when things happen, that there are you know, an opportunity to reset. And one is I would like us to, to you know, reset our relationship when it comes to tourism. Uh, but number two, and most importantly, is that we need to find a better way to house people here in Hawaii. We've had a huge problem with people not being able to remain in the state because they can't afford the cost of living. And it's something that, you know, if something, you know, along this scale happens, that maybe it'll re help reset the real estate market. But then it also give an impetus, you know, for people to really dig in on some of the more innovative, you know, plans, uh, you know, the housing issues that uh, that people have found solutions to, but we just need to have the opportunity to, to implement here, them here. Yeah, well, I'm sure everyone around the world is wishing you and, and everyone on Hawaii, especially Maui, all the best. Maybe there will be a silver lining to be found. Journalist Naka Nathaniel. Naka, we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us tonight. It's good seeing you. Thank you. Good seeing you. Thank you. Good seeing you too. Mahalo. Aloha. All right, we want to go now to our correspondent, Carolina Chamoy. She's covering the story for us from Washington. Carolina, rescue relief efforts, they're still ongoing. What more do we know about the situation on Maui? Yes, precisely, Brent. The search for victims is ongoing. Uh, Hawaii residents continue to try to find their missing loved ones. Uh, Maui County Mayor told reporters today that the death toll consists of people whose bodies have been found outdoors. This means uh, that the rescue teams have not yet uh, searched the interiors of uh, buildings for victims. We also know that nearly 11,000 people remain without power in Maui and that Hawaii emergency management records now show that the warning sirens apparently did not not sound before people run for their lives from the wildfires. Instead, officials send alerts on uh, mobile phones, television, and also radio stations. But widespread power outages uh, may, may have limited uh, the reach of that. We know that tens of thousands of people have been evacuated. Um, where are they staying now? Well, it's
it seems, Brent, that it's people in the community who took uh, the lead in organizing before emergency shelters were installed. Those with extra rooms or trucks offered uh, a shelter, and we also know that residents in nearby areas uh, were also offering food and baby formula, diapers, clothes. Uh, most of them were posting online messages offering help. Uh, but now there are also emergency shelters mainly uh, for the residents, and more than 14,000 visitors have already left Maui on flights. According to um, Hawaii Governor Josh Green, uh, residents of Lahaina will be able to go back to their homes today. Yeah, I think he was quoted as saying that the residents should be prepared to see destruction that they have never seen before in their lives. I know that U.S. President Biden has declared the area um, a state or yeah, emergency, which means it's going to free up some level mm -hmm. of federal funding for the people there. Um, what else is the government doing to help people who've lost everything? Well, we know that President Biden spoke with uh, Governor Josh uh, Green by phone today um, after the governor completed a survey um, of the distraction across Maui. According to the White House, uh, he, the governor, provided the president with a first-hand update and assessment of the latest needs. Uh, the U.S. military also uh, mobilized its emergency response, including 133 National Guard members who are on the ground supporting efforts uh, and um, guard helicopters. They were the first ones uh, to help. They dumped one 100,000 gallons, Brent, of water uh, in only five hours on Wednesday. It's also important to mention that the wildfire that caused uh, this widespread damage was 80 percent contained as of yesterday. However, none of the four major fires on Maui are fully contained yet. Yeah, so much tragedy there for the people, and it happens so quickly. DW's Carolina Chamoy in Washington. Carolina, thank you.